to introduce myself. I'm um, David Albert Jones. I'm the director of the Anscombe Centre in Oxford, formerly the Lineker Centre uh, for Healthcare Ethics, um, which uh, is a Roman Catholic research centre established in 1977, uh, which makes it by our reckoning the first centre for healthcare ethics in the United Kingdom. Uh, could I ask people, um, we're going to have um, uh, a short introduction by each of the speakers uh, and then we're going to have questions. Could I ask people during the first part to not only mute themselves but also turn off their video? This is purely to increase the bandwidth. But during the questions, uh, because it is um, uh, good to see people when they ask questions, uh, you can turn on your video again and we'll see how it goes as far as the um, uh, as far as the bandwidth is concerned, but the, the, for the beginning, if you could just turn off um, your, um, your videos other than uh, Michael, Patricia, Neil and myself, thank you. Um, so the, the Anscombe Centre, if you want more information about the Anscombe Centre, um, it's um, uh, the, it will be on our website, um, which is www.bioethics.org.uk. Uh, and also, if you go there, there's an opportunity for si to sign up for our mailing list. So if you're not on our mailing list, please do sign up uh, and you can get uh, information about events. Uh, the next event we're having after this is our annual um, uh, lecture, uh, our Anska Memorial Lecture. Um, uh, thank you, Becky, for putting that up. Um, uh, Conscience uh, and Respect for Difference um, by um, uh, Aidan uh, O'Neill, QC, QC, QC in Scotland and in England and Wales. Um, Thank you for taking that down. Um, so um, I'll ask the, the, the panelists to each speak for 10 minutes or so, um, and, then, and then we'll, uh, I hope, have plenty of time for questions. Um, this is a very uh, rich area of, um, uh, to, to think about. Uh, I'd ask people, if they have questions, to put questions in the chat function. Um, uh, we had 100 people sign up for this event. I'm not sure how many were able to, to come um, uh, now, but, but we certainly uh, have more people than could ask questions. So please don't be disappointed if your question doesn't get asked, but um, I will pick questions out of the chat. Uh, the event is being recorded. So if you do want to ask a question, but, um, um, but you don't want to be recorded, uh, if you could um, uh, um, put a message to me directly in the, through the chat function, and I can ask the question for you if you wish. Um, so we have uh, speakers from anthropology, from um, clinical medicine, psychiatry, and uh, philosophy. Uh, the first of our speakers uh, uh, is Neil Armstrong, uh, who completed his uh, DPhil in social and cultural anthropology at Oxford uh, in 2018, investigating NHS mental health care and the relationship between uh, care and its institutional surroundings. So that, that's, that's institution and uh, care. And he's now a, sti a stipendary lecturer in anthropology at uh, Magdalen College, Oxford, uh, and has a number of ongoing research projects, <coughs> including uh, collaborative work on student mental health and research into the uh, neglected field of the anthropology of silliness, uh, according to him. So uh, take it away, Neil Armstrong. Great, thank you, uh, David. Now, okay, so my talk is called Some Thoughts About the Moral Hazards of Mental Health Care. And I kind of mean it as, as a sort of provocation in a way, in a very gentle kind of way. Um, I mean, I, th I think in one way you can't talk about mental health and mental health care without it being provocative to someone. I mean, in a way, if you've done a talk and no one's provoked, that just means someone's been left off the guest list, you know, because it's very, very politicized, it's very polarized, and, you know, people disagree really, really. I mean, it makes kind of Trump Biden look like very sedate, I think, in comparison. But what I'm aiming for is, is the kind of provocation that just stimulates thought that potentially kind of makes people see things in a slightly new way or maybe brings people together. So I, I hope that it's kind of provocation that's stimulating and productive rather than, you know, leading to, to fists flying or anything of that sort. And 
I'm going to make kind of one kind of central claim, but claim, that's, that's a big word, but, but just I'm going to say that there are moral hazards associated with imagining yourself in the same way that a mental health professional might imagine you. Were, were I able to operate my computer properly, you would see that on your screen now. So moral hazards associated with imagining yourself in the same way that a mental health profession, professional might imagine you. This is not a critique of how they imagine you. It's a, it, these are comments about what happens if you internalize the same gaze, if you like, internalize the same imaginary. What do I mean by moral hazards? I mean, I mean something quite soft focus, really, and, I, and I'm kind of hoping that in questions people will, will potentially challenge or have ideas or, or, or get, come back to me with something here. But my thought might be that moral hazards leave a person less well equipped to make moral decisions. So it's kind of, kind of quite a, that's quite a soft touch kind of thought. It might be, for example, somebody might be less self-knowing. They might have a, a weaker sense of, of their relationship with people around them, with the environment around them. Um, and so on, or their, their sense of what their moral goals might be, might be less clear or, or, or less well-defined. Okay, so if you could see my screen, I would have a little remark. What is the clinical use of the term mood and who has them? So mood really is, is I'm just taking as a kind of proxy for um, kind of clinical thinking, the way that the clinician might imagine um, a patient. Um, I should say I'm not offering any uh, kind of empirical evidence here. This is kind of drawn from a kind of a kind of ongoing storehouse of ethnographic research. So, so it's sort of I'm happy to kind of substantiate, but I'm not going to do it now. Um, okay, so, but, but but broadly, what is mood? mood? Mood is how people feel in the moment. Good feelings maybe there may be greater or lesser levels of good feelings. Greater or lesser levels of bad feelings. Bad feelings were a bad thing to have. Good feelings are broadly a good thing to have unless they get a little bit too much. Um, when, when people use kind of scores to try to quantify this, often a few more things are brought in. How are you sleeping? How's your weight? How's your attention? That kind of thing. But, but broadly speaking, these are still very, very flat, very, very thin kind of categories. I mean, in, in a way, you might think this is barely scratching the surface of, of, of human life. And I mean, I think that my concern is what's, what's missing. I mean, what, what's remarkably missing, perhaps, is there's no positive concept of personality in, in uh, at least NHS mental health care. Personality disorders exist that might bring people uh, certain sorts of problems, but there's no sense of character, there's no discourse about virtues. Um, moral emotions are, are kind of erased as well. There's really kind of no, not very little that's usefully, could be usefully said about, um, yeah, shame or guilt. And I think that, um, you know, th this, this leap, the thought might be, well, first, in, very much in passing, why? why? Why might these very, very thin categories be the categories that clinicians use to imagine their patients? And obviously, this is a nice little crispy quote from David Graeber, who, who, who died actually quite recently, the anthropologist. Um, and he writes in a kind of punchy way, so he generally gets quoted quite a lot. I'm just going to read what he says but I'm not gonna go into it much more. I'm gonna, again, I leave this for, for, for you to kind of respond to if, if it grabs your attention. But this is what David Graeber said, not about mental health care, but just about a bureaucracy itself. So this is kind of true of any bureaucrat, including of course, a mental health care professional working in a bureaucracy. He says, bureaucratic knowledge is all about schematization. In practice, bureaucratic procedure invariably means ignoring all the subtleties of real social existence and reducing everything to preconceived mechanical or statistical formulae. Whether it's a matter of forms, rules, statistics or questionnaires, it's always a matter of simplification. So he's really saying that if you bureaucratize something, there's always this kind of epistemic degradation, sometimes you know, other kind of commentators call it, things always get simplified. The concern might be, do you want to simplify human distress? So I'm suggesting, the moral hazards that I would, I, I, I'm claiming exist arise out of the reduced expressive capacities that are created by a clinical imaginary that's oriented towards helping clinicians make legible decisions within an accountable bureaucracy. That's a much longer sentence than I would have said had I known that you wouldn't be able to see my screen. Let me say it again. These moral hazards arise out of reduced expressive capacities that are created by a clinical imaginary that's oriented towards helping clinicians make legible decisions within an accountable bureaucracy. 
and I'm, I'm just very briefly going to half unpack that by, by using the work of Miranda Fricker and her idea of hermeneutical injustice. Miranda Fricker's had this huge impact on, um, uh, on uh, well, well she, 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 she's thought about, she has this concept of epistemic injustice, it's been rolled out enormously across mental health care, potentially slightly more than, than well, I mean, again, in discussion, I'd be interested to hear what people think, but I, I feel slightly in, uh, overstated sometimes, but that's really powerful here as well. And she has this idea of, in, in the case of hermeneutical injustice, she says that a language can, can be, um, lack the expressive resources for people to make sense of important areas of their lives. So, so one of the, she has that kind of classic case, of, um, and that would be, uh, Im imagine you, you were a woman working in an office in America in the 1950s. Um, this is a time before the category sexual harassment existed, but it's not a time, of course, before sexual harassment itself uh, did, took place. So a woman might go in, she may have somebody making kind of dodgy jokes to them on, in the lift on the way in. They might have somebody pressuring them into perhaps, perhaps uh, going on dates that you don't want to go on making kind of lewd jokes, brushing past you in a kind of dodgy way. Lots and lots of separate experiences with lots and lots of different colleagues. But what do you kind of, you know, what can you do with it all? Well, without some language like sexual harassment, you can't kind of make sense of it. You can't say this is a phenomenon that I'm being subjected to in my office. And critically, you also can't do much about it. And what I'm, of course, what I'm kind of hinting at here is that these kind of thin categories that psychiatrists need to use because it helps them do their job in an accountable bureaucracy, leave people a bit like the 1950s female office worker without the vocabulary to really make sense of their moral lives. And I think I leave you just, just with a thought really that, that anthropologists amongst others are, are, are concerned really about why, um, the, the sense in which mental health care may has has perhaps smaller effects, has less less clearly helpful effects than other areas of biomedicine, and why research feels stalled over the last few decades, um, where the new treatments aren't emerging, things don't seem to be getting any better, um, and the thought might be that that at least part of the answer might lie in questions that, that randomized controlled trials and and the kind of mainstream research methods of biomedicine just aren't equipped to deal with, and, and maybe this is part of the problem, that, that we're imposing a kind of hermeneutical injustice on the users of mental health care, and that this is a kind of moral hazard, kind of moral harm that you do to someone, that you take very, very complicated, very, very important experiences of distress, of, of um, complex sensory experiences, problems with meaning, with your role in the world, with the sense of the barrier between you and the people around you, and you squeeze them into categories which have very, very limited expressive power to make sense of the experiences, but they do make help clinicians make good decisions. So we want the good decisions, but my question is, there's a moral harm in adopting the same imaginary when you think about yourselves. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for starting us off, Neil. Thank you for being provocative, I hope. Um, and um, if you have questions, even before people finish, uh, speaking, do put things in, in the chat because we can come back to them. But uh, next I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Patricia Casey, uh, who is a uh, consultant psychiatrist at uh, um, uh, Marta Hospital Dublin, also Professor Emeritus at University College Dublin and Adjunct Professor at Notre Dame uh, Medical School Australia. Um, in 2018, um, uh, Professor Casey gave the Anska Memorial Lecture, which was the keynote of a conference that we held at St. Anne's College on the ethics of psychiatry, and her lecture is available on the website uh, uh, of the Anscom Centre, um, www.bioethics.org.uk. I will plug it again. Um, so if I could invite um, uh, Patricia to um, uh, unmute herself and share her video and uh, talk to us about uh, the ethics of psychiatry. Right. Thank you very much indeed, David, and thank you, Neil, um, for, for what you said just a moment ago. Um, in fact, my 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 talk two years ago at the Anscom Memorial Lecture was the Ethics of Psychiatric Diagnosis. Um, and I'm going to touch on that a, a little bit here, but before I, I do that, I want to say 
I am a psychiatrist. I'm a doctor by training. Then I specialize in psychiatry. I work in the Mater Hospital, which is the biggest um, public hospital in the country. Um, there is an inpatient psychiatric unit there. Um, um, I prescribe medications. Um, I would take psychotropic medications myself if I had to. Um, in fact, my husband and I have a prenuptial agreement <laughs> that if ever I became severely depressed, and wasn't responding to antidepressants, I want him to insist that I have ECT. So that's our prenuptial agreement. It's not about money. It's about me, if I become ill, getting um, a treatment that works. If nothing else will work, of course, that, that, goes, that goes without saying. But as well as prescribing medications for people, I also prescribe just as frequently and perhaps more frequently uh, psychological interventions. I offer them myself. I send people um, to uh, psychologists for various therapies that I believe uh, they, their condition warrants and that we're told are evidence-based. Um, I also spend a lot of my uh, working hours and a lot of my consultations stopping medication because I believe that psychotropic medication is overprescribed. Um, I believe that some of the data suggesting that we have this epidemic of mental health, um, of mental ill health is actually wrong. And in fact, had we not had um, the COVID epidemic, I had um, and was accepted to do a presentation at the Edinburgh Festival. The uh, university doesn't, the University of Edinburgh does an outreach um, and it's called the Cabaret of Dangerous Ideas and one has, one has to present a dangerous idea and that's my dangerous idea, that there is no epidemic of clinical depression in, in the world. So what gives the impression that there is? Um, as I say, I'm a psychiatrist and I believe depressive illness exists and it can be very serious and it has got a mortality rate in severe depression of about eight to 10% due to suicide. So it's a real serious thing to have clinical depression and to not get the proper treat for it. But what gives this impression that a quarter of the population or thereabouts um, need treatment for some mental health disorder at any one time? And that about 24, about the same percentage will get depression in the course of their lifetime. And it's really to do with how we in psychiatry make diagnoses. And it's down to um, the two, to two books. Uh, Neil mentioned some another anthropologist who talked about reducing things to statistics. Well, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual is um, sometimes fatuously called the Bible of Psychiatry. It is nothing like the Bible. It is a conglomerate of conditions, the number of which has increased um, by more than a hundred um, since the first DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, was developed in 1952. And there were then 263 conditions. In DSM-5, which came out in 2013, there are 368. So if you believe that the number of psychiatric disorders has increased by uh, one third, more than one third since the first DSM. Now that's, a, that's a, a crazy notion. I mean, that that clearly isn't the case. It boils down to a couple of things. One is the fact that often diagnoses come about because somebody speaks very loudly about it. So there will be advocates for a particular diagnosis. Gaming disorder is one. Um, um, disruptive mood dysregulation is another. Um, reactive attachment disorder is another. There are advocates who sit in on the, the meetings um, of this organization and they advocate, sorry, I, they advocate for these um, concepts. And he who speaks loudest is heard. And so they get included with very little, often with very little evidence. So by the time the next DSM comes about, some of the conditions that now exist will have gone. And for example, um, at one point, homosexuality was regarded as a psychiatric diagnosis. 
that that went. Um, sadomasochism was regarded as a psychiatric diagnosis. That went. Narcissistic personality disorder was regarded as a, as a category. Then it left and now it's back again. So these things co come and go. And it's, it's in some ways, um, I'm embarrassed to be part of that um, kind of profession that so glibly invents conditions. But I also feel that one is best challenging this from the inside out rather than leaving. Now, I'm not a member of the critical psychiatry group. There is a group in psychiatry called the critical psychiatry group who don't believe that psychiatry, psychiatric illness exists. I do not for one moment believe that as I think I have already persuaded you. So, so there are all of these diagnoses that are coming and come and go, and they're made based on symptoms. What does the person complain of? And so the symptoms are ticked off. There's a tick box procedure. So in DSM-4 or 5, you could get diagnosed as having major depression if you have uh, five symptoms for two weeks or more. Now, the symptoms, mind you, have to be there most of the time. But think of it. Um, if um, I have had um, a bad row with my best friend, or worse again, say with my husband, not that he arouses, I'm afraid he might send me for ECT if we did. But if we, if supposing I had a terrible row with him, I'm sure I would have five symptoms for two weeks. Because put yourself in the position of somebody you've had a big dispute with somebody you care deeply about. You certainly wouldn't be sleeping. You would be very worried and upset and distressed about it. You'd be thinking about it a lot. You'd be probably crying about it if separation was on the cards. You may not be eating well because people when get distressed, get distressed even when their cat is sick, they often don't eat because they're worried. So you probably wouldn't eat. You wouldn't be concentrating very well because you'd be talking about it all the time and so on. So you can easily get your five symptoms for two weeks and be diagnosed as having major depression and got, get put on antidepressants. And that is not a healthy way in which diagnoses should be made. I believe that diagnoses should be ma made not just based on symptoms, but I believe they should be based on, firstly, what we know to be the cause, the etiology. And I somewhat disagree with Neil, who observed that, you know, in psychiatry treatments and knowledge about it seem to be static. The neurosciences is developing very rapidly and I'm hoping that there will be some reprieve. I mean, Neil is right. There aren't many new treatments on the horizon, but um, in terms of medications um, or indeed even psychological interventions. But I think the neuroscience is throwing up um, some new ideas, particularly, about Im particularly in relation to imaging studies in the brain that are focusing on um, ex psychological experiences and how they're mapping on to parts of the brain. So I would like to see us move to look at what is the cause, what are the abnormal biological underpinnings of these syndromes that we call mental illnesses. So, so some prerequisite underpinning feature that, that should be biological. I would like to then see the symptoms, but I'd like to see the symptoms weighted because there are, for, for any one condition, there are only about nine or 10 possible symptoms you can have. And in, Sakai, in, in the current system, you, 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 these symptoms are not weighted. They're all given equal weight. So a suicide, if somebody who is depressed and has a suicidal plan, that exactly has exactly the same weight as not eating. And clearly that's, that's wrong. Clearly some symptoms should be given stronger weight as they used to be in the older classifications. Um, certain symptoms like feeling worse in the morning, um, waking early in the morning, having suicidal ideation, being agitated, were all given more weight in diagnosing what was then called endogenous depression. We don't have that anymore. And I believe we should return to that. And I believe we should also base diagnosis on the core, if the person has had prior episodes, what the likely course, in, what the course in the past was and what the likely course into the future is. And only when we arrive at that level of knowledge should we call these psychiatric conditions. So I believe there should be much tighter control of these conditions for which we 
prescribe various interventions, medications or psychological interventions. Um, I know that some people will, will be concerned that, you know, about the use of medications to help things like mood or anxiety and, and that, but I think we shouldn't be pitting drugs against psychotherapy. I think we have to, for each condition, evaluate each and see what works and what doesn't work. The same as happens in general medicine. So for example, if somebody has a psychotic illness, um, they would not respond to, um, psychological, to psychological interventions, um, except for isolated symptoms like hallucinations, but all the person would not be restored to functioning unless they take medication. And there's a very famous medical legal case that involved a doctor in the US a few years ago. Um, it was called the Orfet case or the Orset case. And this doctor uh, was developed a psychotic depression. He had delusions of guilt and delusions of ill health. And he was admitted to a, a hospital, a psychiatric unit, who, and they refused to um, give him medication. Instead, they offered him psychological therapy for seven months, which didn't work. And he then took his own discharge and went to another hospital where he got antipsychotic medication and within a month was much better. But during the seven months that he was receiving ineffective psychological intervention, his wife left him. He was struck off the medical register and could no longer practice as a doctor. So I think we have to be careful what we wish for. And I, I don't think we should be um, um, poo-pooing um, pharmacological intervention um, and saying everything that's psychological, all psychological interventions are good and pharmacological interventions are bad. It just doesn't work like that. And a good psychiatrist will recognize that. So I think we have a lot to do in psychiatry with regard to how we classify psychiatric illnesses, how we make diagnosis and how we prescribe. But we have to continue to be able to prescribe medications, physical treatments and psychological treatments. Thank you very much. So th thank you very much, uh, Patricia. And um, uh, third of our panel uh, is Michael Wee, who is Education and Research Officer at the Anscombe Bioethics Centre. Uh, he's also a PhD candidate uh, in philosophy at Durham University, where he is researching on uh, Wittgenstein's philosophy of the language and its connection to ethics. Uh, in January of this year, he completed a research project on virtue and mental health, sponsored by the Jubilee Center for Character and Virtue at the University of Birmingham. So uh, uh, over to you, Michael. Well, thanks very much, David, and thanks, uh, Neil and Patricia, for your contributions. I have to say, um, the three of us didn't quite um, coordinate what we were going to say, except by agreeing on, on a common theme and title of the event. So hopefully what I'm going to say will at least complement uh, some of what the other two panelists have said. So mind, brain or heart, so that's the title of today's event, what exactly is being treated in mental health care? And I speak, uh, as David mentioned, really as somebody coming from philosophy, not, not a psychiatrist, uh, not a social scientist. Now, when, we, when one surveys the philosophical literature surrounding um, psychiatry, one quite quickly comes across even in fairly recent articles, uh, this complaint that psychiatry relies on a biologistic or brain reductionist view of the patient. Now, I'd like to start by saying, I, I wonder if that has become more of a trope these days and a very tired trope at that, as opposed to a valid criticism of the reality on the ground of psychiatric care. Now, once upon a time, there was much more of a, an aspiration that mental illness, all mental illnesses could be scientifically explained, that is by means of physical evidence. And one of the most popular candidates was, was a you know, particular brain lesions corresponding to particular um, psychological illnesses. But that hope I think has run its course and has largely faded, at least in that total sense or total explanation. And um, there was also the, in, in the 1960s in particular, the anti-psychiatry movement, most famously with Thomas Saz and his um, still controversial paper, which you can find online, I'm sure mental illness is a myth. So something that um, Patricia Casey already alluded to, this 
anti-psychiatry, a critical psychiatry movement, people who don't believe that mental illnesses exist. Anyway, I, I, so I once asked a, a practicing psychiatrist in the UK about this, uh, about his thoughts on this, this common criticism. And he said, and he said, well, so what, do you, what do you think about all these philosophers and, and other writers who, who say that um, psychiatrists still believe that happiness and, and other well-being can be, quote unquote, pharmacologically induced? And he thought that was very much a caricature. Uh, that you know the, the the idea that psychiatrists see their patients as a bunch of brain cells to to be treated, to be corrected, uh, to be uh, modified in their brain chemistry. So that was that was plainly wrong in his experience in in the UK. So now I now personally, for one, I I, I don't doubt the uh, the efficacy of psych um, psychi psychiatric medication where appropriate. I'm not a I'm not qualified to comment on when that is, but I don't doubt in general it has its role. Um, though I don't want to disregard the problem, I think there is a kind of stereotypical image of psychiatry being um, uh, at prey to, you know, big pharma and, and interest groups, you know, lobbying for pharmaceutical products, and and perhaps in some countries more than others, there is th that problem is, is is larger. But but by and large, I think, in my experience at least, and, and anecdotally as well. It doesn't seem to me that, that psychiatrists necessarily treat their patients as a kind of yeah, as a bunch of brain cells to be to be corrected. Um, and you know, psychiatry has moved on from the 60s from those debates with anti-psychiatrists. So we recognize, you know, broadly, I don't mean we as an I'm not a psychiatrist, but broadly speaking, researchers often recognize social determinants of mental health. Uh, you know, financial problems, for example, the, the effects of economic downturns. Um, and some of you may also be aware of the whole field of positive psychology. Now, uh, which, which aims to redress the balance of mental health, um, you know, from its focus on pathology, on negative symptoms, to try and reorientate it towards the positive pole, the positive side of things, looking at positive character traits, uh, states of flourishing and definitions of flourishing. Now, it's, it's, it's a growing field, positive psychology, and it's also faced a lot of criticism. And one criticism actually is, is not, not, not against the way it conceptualizes things per se, but simply that a lot of these things, a lot of these ideas have already been present in some form and indeed practiced, say, by, by counselors. Uh, so, you know, psychiatrists might not have been doing it at some point, but other mental health care professionals uh, who, who take different approaches, they've already been thinking about the, the use of positive uh, character traits. So, so that, that, that's one perhaps fairly minor criticism, not to say that it doesn't have uh, a contribution to make, but we should reinvent the wheel. But all of that, I think, engages with a much more mature understanding of the nature of mental illness. Now, as, as Patricia has already pointed out, and to some, to some extent, Neil, this is still a work in progress, but, but we do have a slightly better understanding of mental illness compared with you know, a couple of decades ago. And one, one of the prevailing views, not the only view, but one, one common view, I think this is from DSM-4, slightly earlier version of the current one, looks at mental illness in terms of either, well, the, the key plank of it is either distress, say a painful symptom, or impairment, you know, disability, uh, uh, well, uh, not being able to function in a particularly significant way. So distress or impairment, but with some qualifications that it should be, it shouldn't be an expectable response to an event. It shouldn't be culturally, something that's culturally sanctioned or socially expected as a response, say, to, to bereavement, or, and, and is not simply social deviance. Now, and I, and I think this you've already heard from, from Patricia, that the, the way that some psychiatrists approach or perhaps omit that qualification, that it shouldn't be an expected, an expectable response to an event, say quarreling with your husband or bereavement. Now that certainly causes problems for diagnosis, but I think if we had more of a sense of that as a necessary caveat, now we can talk about what is an expectable or normal social response, but if we have that in mind, then that will solve some, some problems. So whether or not you think that there is more or less of a biological substrate for mental illness, and I don't deny there is a biological component, and that's where medication comes in, so long as social dysfunction, the lack of ability to function in a significant way, and that's defined by social terms, so long as that is part of the picture, then you know, that brain reductions view just simply isn't, isn't very useful to us.
and what are these you know, uh, and, so, and the social aspect of mental illness well that's manifested or at least diagnosed predominantly in terms of thoughts thought processes in terms of behaviors so what are we left with to treat well again as i, as I mentioned you, you, you can address the neurological the, the brain aspect of mental illness and as a complement or as an alternative to that you can also try to address uh, the mental symptoms as such or to address the mental symptoms directly so to speak to, to, to target those uh, thought processes those the behaviors that flow from those thought processes that make you know that, that that are the manifestation of that dysfunction in question now a question i'd like to pose then is well you, you can say all you want about you, you can talk all you want about well we, do, we don't want to treat happiness as something that's a pharmacological induction you know we, we we do want to recognize the use of medication but not over rely on it or over prescribe it but is there a risk that if you that in place of psychotropic medication that when you turn instead to psychological interventions you know uh, interventions of positive psychology or interventions of such as cognitive behavioral therapy do these become a kind of non-chemical form of medication if it's still approached with a with a fairly reductionist or mechanistic philosophy of mind now my purpose here is not to criticize um, the way that many say, psychologists psychotherapists practice their, their their trade it's it's not even to say that they necessarily see their patients see their the, the illness that they're treating in such a mechanistic way which i'll explain in a, in a bit but to say that this is a kind of risk from that arises from the language virtues or uh, positive character traits and mental health and um now it shouldn't be it shouldn't be a surprise that obviously having a healthy mind is you might say constituted in part by the presence of some of these positive traits uh now i say i say the word constituted rather than caused it's it's fairly it would seem fairly obvious that if you are if you are of a healthy mind you would have a fairly normal range of virtuous or shall we say positive character traits behaviors behaviors of gratitude pro-social behavior and such like things now the literature surrounding this correlation in positive psychology is fairly rich it's broad there's a lot of different uh, positive character traits being studied in relation to various states or reports of positive well-being or, or indeed of mental illness or at least uh, a lack of flourishing now the literature surrounding specifically clinical effectiveness of these uh, of interventions relying on these positive states now that's far less promising it's a lot less spectacular there is some modest evidence that say you know uh, getting people what a favorite positive psychology intervention is getting people to write uh, gratitude letters or, or create or, or write a gratitude diary to think about things that you might be thankful for um, and, and that now in, in a, in a non-clinical population seems to correlate very well with well-being, with flourishing, depending on how you define those. And when it comes to its use in clinical populations, people who are hospitalized for severe depression, for example, or suicidal uh, attempts, uh, that it's a bit more modest. And, and I think one has to say, well, are we, are we again, are we mistaking what, what constitutes good mental health with what causes good good mental health um, and are we really thinking that in effect we can induce e induce states of well-being even if not by medication by these simple or simplistic exercises of positive psychology uh, there, there was a uh, a big study of the the effort the, eff the efficacy of some of these positive psychology interventions in 2014 uh, which I'm and and one of the, the findings they said was that, uh, this paper found was that straightforward exercises that did not require substantial introspection appeared to, form, uh, to, to perform best. So exercises on gratitude, the gratitude letter, for example, had high utility scores and were associated with substantial improvements in optimism, one of the factors that they 
that they measured. In contrast, the forgiveness letter exercise performed most poorly. Uh, qualitatively, many patients experienced a resurgence of anger or sadness when recalling a past slight and found it difficult to move past these feelings in the midst of crisis. Now, again, I'm not saying that these fairly simplistic uh, positive psychology interventions don't have a place in, in psych psychological treatment, but the, quest but, but, the, but the question is more, what, what are the uh, what are the philosophical assumptions behind it? And if you if you think that uh, you know your your job there is simply to kind of uh, create more um, happy vibes, so to speak, and and therefore through these non chemical means induce a state of well being, uh, and I'm sure that people don't seriously think that, but that's a kind of risk that they might think in in that way. Um, and even and I'll, I'll, I'm going to end very soon, but just say even cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, obviously more well established than positive psychology interventions and this question about whether you can combine the two but even CBT sometimes falls prey to to separating elements of the mind artificially so you know CBT practitioners might try to um, help patients uncover uh, negative thoughts or or dysfunctional beliefs and what happens is that you know you might have a conversation with a therapist who then who, who tries to say, well, when you were in that moment of social anxiety, what, what were you thinking? What was the thought going through your head? And once you start using language like that, what's the thought going through your head? There is this uh, an underlying assumption some, sometimes that what you're looking for is not so much a thought process, but the uh, what some philosophers might call a, a cogitation, the actual mental occurrence that, you know, when somebody says, you know, I, I felt I felt I could never be like them, and that's the cause of the social anxiety. It's not to say that you know, in that particular social situation, in that particular moment, you know, they had literally those words, that thought in their head, I could never be like them. Now, it may be useful in some occasions in CBT to draw out some of those underlying thoughts or beliefs in order to put them into a good structure. Um, and and, and, and a, a good CBT, uh, therapists presumably would would be aware that you know it's not just a kind of mechanistic uh, rhythm of thoughts that you're trying to correct uh, in a kind of artificial way, uh, but sometimes in making patients uh, externalize these thoughts, you know, artificially separate beliefs or thoughts as if they were things that occurred in the mind, as opposed to underlying attitudes. Some some critics would point to a risk of perhaps self alienation that if, the, if these are thoughts which you really need to, to take ownership of and, and dialogue with, as it were, rather than you know, something that you, you, might, you really need to separate from. And it really depends on the context, on the kind of illness that you're trying to treat. If you treat these thoughts as discrete mental entities, you can artificially separate and put into a kind of structure uh, which, you, which you think you can mechanistically correct, more than I think in, in, some, in some situations, in some clinical contexts, that's not going to be be so useful. So I think, and so I think, just to round to, to round up this this short um, presentation, just to say that, well, how do we think of um, you know mental states, mental thought processes, behaviors, um, positive or negative character traits uh, in in psychiatry and psychology? I think if we if we were to think of these things as discrete entities, which you can put into a flow chart onto as many uh, therapists do. Now that might be useful as a heuristic, as a means of, of uh, you know, trying to, to represent the structures of thought. But if you think that that's actually what goes on in the head of the pick, quite literally what goes on in the head of the patient, then I think in some circumstances that might not be so useful. And that might also reinforce a kind of belief that, you know, even if we're not saying, oh, this patient can't help it because it's their brain chemistry that causes them, even if you didn't take that kind of reduction, when you think of the processes of the mind in that kind of mechanistic way, you might still think, oh, they can't help it because that's the way the mind works, almost like cogs, you know, turning in, uh, against each other. And, and how do you factor in responsibility and taking, taking responsibility for your own thoughts? Uh, I think that's a very delicate balance to be uh, to be handled by by therapists. So that's that's where I'm going to end, and hopefully that that complements somewhat the other two speakers. So th th thank you very much, um, um, Michael. Uh, so I, I invite people if they have questions to to put questions in in the chat. 
Um, and uh, to keep yourself on mute unless you're invited to, but if you wish to uh, uh, share a video, then uh, feel free to do so. Um, uh, we have a, a question, or I think perhaps a, a, a challenge in the form of a question from uh, 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 Anulika Igboka uh, in relation to, to how critical psychiatry was characterized both in a way by Michael and by by Patricia. Mm. Uh, so, Anulika, would you like to make your point? Um, yeah, I was just going to say that the um, critical psychiatry network, uh, I don't, I remember that, I don't get the impression that it, it says that mental illness doesn't exist. Um, I think it's more just taking a, um, a stance that 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 the sort of reductionist approach to uh, to assessment, and diagnosis, um, and management sometimes um, sort of needs to be perhaps challenged um, to to some degree. Um, and I think it's obviously it's it's made up by various members and people with different stances. And I'm by no means ex, you know extreme, but I, I attend some of the conferences and I think it's I, I meet people who are who are part of the network or who do go to conferences and it's more about you meet many people who are much more holistic in their approach and it's more about how can we maintain a holistic approach to managing mental illness um, which doesn't just focus on psychotropic medication but also considers you know psychological therapies and social factors cultural factors um, and things like that. Yes, you do get extreme members who have extreme points of views, um, but I think that that it's probably fair to say that it's, it isn't sort of purely anti-psychiatry, uh, which has kind of might have been the impression that that some people might get from hearing that it um, doesn't believe in mental illness. So I thought I'd just clarify that point, really. It was a great, 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 great talk. Otherwise, thanks. Would you, would you like to respond to that, Patricia? Yeah, thanks very much indeed, and th thanks for the comment. Um, th the reason I said it's anti-psychiatry is because um, the anti because the critical psychiatry group um, challenge the use of psychotropic medication, even for for you know severe depression, but also they challenge the concept of diagnosis. And so, if if, if you can't diagnose an individual who describes a particular cluster of symptoms um, and, 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 and diagnosis is central to how you treat somebody across, across medicine. So if you take the view that really diagnosis is impossible or we, we can't or we shouldn't have diagnosis and we really shouldn't be using medication and some, some, of, some of them very strongly oppose the use of any pharmacological agents. I mean, I've heard somebody say that they have never seen somebody with depression get better with an antidepressant member of the, of the, uh, of the critical psychiatry group. So I think with that constellation of attributes, it is safe to say that there, the, the group's understanding of psychiatry differs from that of most of us. It's also untrue to say that we over rely on medication. I mean, I prescribe and refer people for psychotherapy as often as I give them medication. Um, and I, I mean, I, that isn't unique to me. That is how psychiatry works. We talk about the biopsychosocial model of psychiatry that is supposed to operate now. And we do take account of all of those, of all, all of those factors. Um, I think there is overprescription for, for reasons to do with how we diagnose, but that doesn't invalidate diagnosis and it doesn't invalidate the appropriate use of, of medication. So I think critical psychiatry is slightly wide of the mark in, in opposing all diagnostic labels and in critiquing, as it seems to me they are the use of all medications. I have no connection whatsoever with the pharmaceutical industry, but I prescribe medications and I would want my nearest and dearest to have 
medications if they had certain illnesses, if they if they had something like like social anxiety, as Michael described in his example, I would not want them to have medication. I don't think it's an appropriate intervention. So I think you know we have to choose horses for courses, and that's what most um, psychiatrists do to the best of our ability with the limitations that that we have in our in in our diagnostic tools. Thank you very much. I think both Neil and, and Michael might have also comments on it. So, uh, um, Michael first. Yeah, um, well, thanks very much, um, Annalika, if I'm saying that right, for, um, uh, for your comment. I think it's very helpful. Now, I, I, I would say in fairness to, to those who are, who might be called critical anti-psychiatrists, um, in fairness to, to, to those who say that you, uh, mental illness doesn't exist or mental illness is a myth and these are you know provocative statements uh, probably meant to be provocative as well they don't most most if not all of people all the people who say things like that aren't suggesting for one moment that mental illnesses or what we call mental mental illnesses aren't problems that need to be addressed i think my understanding is, is that they generally take the line that well, these are really more moral or social problems and we shouldn't medicalize them shouldn't diagnose them or treat them in a medical way and i think my and i'm not and i, and I think that that some of their crit criticisms have have you know validity they have genuine insight but my a very brief response for me would be to say that well it first of all depends on what you mean by my illness you know mental illnesses might not be natural kinds they might not be you know like COVID 19 like a like an infection that you catch and maybe they're a bit more like how we conceptualize physical illness such as um, high blood pressure it's more similar to high blood pressure than than say you know diseases of the of the autoimmune system or, or something like that so that, that that's one thing i would say and, and the second thing is to say that well yes um quite quite clearly i think there are moral and or social dimensions to many mental illnesses um but that fact in itself um, shouldn't exclude, uh, you know, the, the 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 validity of bringing in medicalized means of treating the problem, provided you don't over medicalize or over prescribe. But where you know social or moral problems intersect with with the body, um, as some me mental illnesses do, I would say at least at least some, it's not necessarily wrong to bring in medical means of of treating that. You see that particularly in even in say the area of sexual health. Where there are lots of problems which are physical but which don't necessarily get treated unless there is an actual adverse impact on the psychology on the more social well-being of of the person and and there's some kind of analogy with with that i, I would say did, did did you want to come in neil yes if i could just make one one tiny remark but i'd, I'd also like to hear the questioner whether whether uh, whether she feels kind of satisfied with what we're saying but i um I'm not a critical psychiatrist, obviously, though I, ha I did want to speak at one of their conferences. Um, um, the, the thing that I would say is I think their views are much less extreme and much less, um, uh, it's much, much less uh, I think they're much more widely held than you might think. When I started my PhD research quite, quite a while back now, I was very self-conscious that I was a uh, um, anthropologist and, and I you know I'm not doing an RCT I don't do you know proper kind of proper science and I thought that all this I was meeting with all these psychiatrists and I thought I'd have to kind of justify what I was doing so so I'd, I'd often be quite apologetic and quite I, I felt I had to put a sort of a, a brave methodological face on what I was doing and actually most of the time particularly away from kind of academic centers people would say thank goodness you know we don't believe in our CTs. All that stuff about evidence-based medicine, I don't think so. I just don't think that really tells us anything about my patients. These are consultant psychiatrists saying this to me. This is, you know, I'm not imagining it. They would often say, well, I can't say this to my colleagues. And sometimes, actually, they'd walk down the corridor and then their colleague would say it to me as well. So, so I do think that there's, there's something going on about what people truly believe, and then maybe it's a certain sort of slight simplifications of what people believe that they need to be able to get the job done. So that's just a, a, yeah, a little thought. Thank, thank you very much. We've had some more questions coming in, which is good, but also means that I'm not necessarily going to be able to get to everyone. Um, uh, one that's come uh, to me, but it's for, for Patricia. Uh, a, a student who who um, has some experience working in a, um, uh, on a psychiatric ward, 
um, and working closely with doctors, I noticed how doctors seem to vary quite significantly in how they dealt with patients from doctors who spent a long time talking to a patient before making a diagnosis to doctors who seem to make a diagnosis almost before they were ad admitted extremely quickly and those who um, seem to be basing their, their uh, the way in which they're working on things learned a long time ago um, or in more stereotype ways and so th there seems to be um, um, a lot of variation in in terms of 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 how um, uh, how actually in practice it depends so much on the individual clinician. Um, um, and if I could just add a, a little rider to that with a question of my own, um, uh, we've had I think a little in your talk and um, um, and perhaps implicitly in Neil's I'm not sure a sort of division between. Um, uh, interventions, um, um, pharmacological interventions and, and um, psychological in interventions. And I think that the impression outside um, medicine sometimes is that the, 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 the pharmacological ones are the dangerous ones which have the side effects and the, and the, the, the psychological ones are the, uh, are, are the more hu humane ones which have, have fewer likelihood of, of adverse side effects. But, but, but I'm, I'm very much aware that psychological interventions also have their risks and can have their side effects. So, um, uh, um, and, and that I suppose goes with this question about va variation with clinicians and whether we should be concerned about variation with clinicians when it comes to, to psychiatric diagnosis and practice. <laughs> well, I think we should be concerned about variations in clinicians in any branch of, of medicine, but it's part of, part of the, the reality of, you know, how, how people function, the personalities of the individuals concerned. Yeah, sure, some psychiatrists make diagnoses simply based on what the person tells them. Others make it getting information from other sources, like getting collateral information, et cetera, et cetera. Others uh, um, turn to psychologists and get them to do pencil and paper tests and incorporate them. So there are very different practices. And, and crucial in making a diagnosis, I think, is how you relate to the patient and the empathy that you show with the patient. And if you show, uh, if you show empathy and understanding and concern and compassion, um, the person will open up a lot more um, about their thoughts and they will try and find language for, for the phenomena that they're experiencing internally. So yes, the the the, the person the the, the 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 I think you said it was a student who made that observation is correct. Psychiatrists do vary in how they make diagnoses. That of course tells us nothing about how accurate the diagnoses are, um, and that's another day's work. Um, you're also right. Your own observation, David, that um, that um, um, sort of drugs are bad and psychotherapy is good. And that's that's a, a terribly that's a Jew, a very dualistic philosophy, you know. The drugs are for the physical things, and the psychotherapy is for the kind of psychological things, and that kind of dualism doesn't really um, hold up in psychiatry, or shouldn't hold up in psychiatry, because, um, for example, religious experiences. Um, can map onto parts of the brain and you can see the brain lighting up when people undergo certain religious experiences. And if we get a chance, I can talk about them later on, but we, we may not do, but, but there are some very interesting studies on, on, on that. Um, you also rightly say that there are side effects to psychotherapy and unfortunately they're often neglected. And, and even the studies examining um, psychological interventions pay very little attention to things like dropouts because of worsening symptoms or dropouts because of in, in, ineffectiveness. And in, in randomized controlled trials of drugs, those kinds of issues are considered um, and they're hugely important in the data analysis, but that doesn't apply at all as much in the psychological therapies. But there is now an beginning to be an increase in interest in the side effects of psychological therapies like well firstly the therapists the kinds of people who are therapists the the, the, the boundary transgressions that are 
have been clearly documented in large numbers um, between therapists and patients. Secondly, the therapies themselves, you know, the, the, the dependence they can induce, the worsening of symptoms after therapy begins, the fact that people's range of um, schema for solving problems changes and they use the model that the therapist uses when they're making decisions themselves afterwards rather than using other models. All of these kinds of side effects are only beginning to be to be studied now. And there is a psychologist um, called Lillian Field who has written quite extensively about, about those um, side effects. I think David Lillian, Lillian Field, this is, is, is his first name, David Lillian Field, and, and they're worth reading. He's gone into this in quite considerable detail. So there is no intervention without its side effects and psychological interventions have them as well, but they're not as clearly or as easily acknowledged as are those attached to, to pharmacotherapy. Does Michael O'Neill, do you want to come in? No. Uh, there's another um, question ca which came in earlier for, for, for Patricia. Uh, I think it's Tabs Preston um, in relation to, to mental illness diagnosis. Was that the... In Oops. Was That might just be the name of the on the computer, which was, well, I'll I'll, I'll read it then. Um, uh, Patricia, what would be the process for changing methods of mental illness diagnosis? So, if there's a if there's an issue here about about um, overdiagnosis, then how do we go about changing that? Well, I think first of all we have to try and find a way of. And I've lost my my picture. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know why that is. Um, I think we first of all have to um, go about a way of distinguishing normal or, as Michael said, the expectable reactions that are talked about in the classifications from the um, from pathological reactions. And there's already a problem here because in the American classification they allow grief to be um, an abnormal to grief classified as being a psychiatric illness. Um, so I think we have to distinguish between normal grief and abnormal grief, and I don't think we do that very well. I think um, we have to, and, and by the way, in relation to your question, um, uh, um, grief therapy for normal grief is one of the therapies that has found to be damaging. So if people who are grieving normally go for counseling, um, there are several large studies that show they actually suffer long-term adverse consequences to their grief and to resolving the grief. So, so identifying abnormal grief from normal grief is one of the things. I think when it comes to depression, what's sadness at, you know, the state of the world or fed up with COVID or, you know, being sad because you've lost a dear friend and an illness and where are the boundaries between the two? And the boundaries are actually, have become increasingly blurred over the years as the salience given to certain symptoms has changed. So I think we need to look at that as, as, as well. We need to look at what symptoms will distinguish clinical depression as it used to be called or, or um, melancholic depression or endogenous depression from the kind of sadness and unhappiness that we call adjustment disorders. Um, and I've written quite a bit about that. I've done a book on it, in fact. So I think we need to start looking at that kind of area um, to move things. It's not an easy task, I'll grant you. Um, and just to give, and I shouldn't be saying just to give you a laugh, but an example of how difficult it is, and I suppose it is funny, um, a very well-known researcher called, um, I think it was Horowitz, has written a paper on post-traumatic stress disorder. And if you take all the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, and there are about 20 of them, and mix and match them, you can get 369,000 different types of adjustment disorder because of the different combinations of symptoms. And that's the kind of problem we're facing. So we're dealing with, with very complex um, issues as to how we um, um, decide what symptoms are really relevant and which ones aren't. But I think um, we, it was hoped that we would be farther down the road with bio, biological markers for these conditions. We are not, and Neil hinted at that, but you know, it's to be hoped that in the future with imaging studies, 
and with, as neuroscience advances that, that that will improve. But these are some of my preliminary thoughts on what we should be doing about symptoms. Thank you very much. There's a question from Jennifer Booth for Michael. Jennifer, oh, we can't hear you. Oh, so I'll, I'll te technical problems. I'm uh, 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 sold as again, I'm afraid. Um, so um, Michael Jennifer was asking, is positive psychology mixing up being good and being well? Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's a tough question. And I think it's not, it, it is often raised in, in the literature. I think there's a question of, well, first of all, a question of circularity between um, you know, concepts of virtue or moral goodness and concepts of, of mental well-being, social well-being, flourishing. Uh, and uh, so I'm just going to read you a quote by, by one critic of this kind of positive psychology who writes in 2008. Uh, the investigators of these studies found that patients who reported that they felt peaceful, had a reason for living, had a sense of purpose and meaning and felt a sense of harmony and comfort, were less likely to be suicidal, hopeless or experience despair. Is that not obvious? Are such findings reportable in one of the world's top medical journals? Now, I think now my response to that would be to say that in, in one sense, it is obvious. Um, and you know, one, as I said in my talk, one should not be surprised that people who are mentally well uh, tend to also have um, display behaviors of you know, pro-social behaviors, altruism, they're able to feel normal range of being happy, being grateful and, and, and such like things. Um, but, but it's not to say that they're exactly the same thing. So they're kind of, they're kind of overlapping concepts. And I think, so I, I would say the first answer is, yeah, I think I would say that they are overlapping concepts. And the second thing to say is, well, then translating them, because they are, they are overlapping in very intricate and complicated ways, translating that into successful interventions gets more, becomes more of a tricky business uh, because, um, you know, being, being mentally well might be constituted in part by uh, being able to feel grateful. Gratitude is one of the most common traits looked at in positive psychology. But does that mean that therefore, when somebody is not mentally well, uh, you can make them well in part by making them feel grateful again? One, the first doesn't you know, um, imply the other. I think we've got to be quite careful about the exact relationship uh, between the two. And I think that's better answered from a conceptual point of view rather than just from, from looking at the, the evidence base. Thank you. Do you want to come in? either Patricia or Neil. So, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt there. Yes, I was just trying to unmute myself. Just to say, I think what virtue Michael is talking about is what we would call resilience or would be contributing to resilience. And we know that resilience is very much um, in the minds of psychiatrists and psychologists. So we do try in therapy with people, identify their strengths that may at the time during an episode of illness be, be hidden. But uh, we try to uh, identify what, what supports they have, where they draw resilience from, um, and that would include the, the, the positive psychology and virtues that, that you mentioned. So, um, yeah, so, so just, just, just to put it in that context. So in, in terms of being being good and being well, it, it's, it, it is also the case that sometimes being good means that people sacrifice the opportunity to be well. Um, so people who, um, in, in cases of, in times of crisis, people who, who work, you know, long hours or go to very dangerous places or uh, have other kind of sacrifices for the sake of, of doing some good deed may be quite traumatized by it. Um, people at the moment who are uh, working um, in, 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 the health, in the healthcare sector, many of them are quite traumatized by, by the, some of the things they are being 
forced to do and but those are, are, are they're doing because um, uh, they're they're being impelled by 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 virtue by 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 goodness so certainly at least some of the time and at least in a um, in particular context uh, being good might um, uh, uh, might lead you to, to to situations where where it's difficult to also uh, be well um, as um, as, as Victor White, I think, explored in, in Soul and Psyche um, many years ago. Um, we have a, a, I'd like to try to bring in some people if, if the, the technology uh, allows. So Desmond Brown, you had a question. Uh, yes, I, what I said was, uh, I, if, if, I wonder if anyone could con con uh, comment on how well, not so much how well, but uh, sort of the, the, the moral challenges and ethical challenges of assessing whether treatment is working, you know, as simply as, and that would include both pharmacologic and, uh, and other types of treatments in the sense that who gets to decide when a treatment is working and is effective? Um, how, you know, ECT was mentioned earlier in one context, and I know of, uh, very good places that do a lot of ECT where their, uh, the, their ability to assess whether it's really working is really pretty primitive. Um, and I also uh, wonder some often about uh, the stopping of psychiatric medications and uh, how that is perhaps not done uh, as often and in the way that it should. So if anyone, a particular uh, Patricia could comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Um. For, I didn't know there was anywhere in the world now doing ECT. We, we hardly use it at all here now, so I, I, I can't comment on that much anymore. But in relation to how long medication works, I mean, we know from, for example, um, studies um, that um, people need antidepressants. After the first episode of depression, your risk of relapse is highest in the first six months. So you, you, you need you need to continue antidepressants for six to nine months and then stop them. With, with in schizophrenia, when antipsychotic medication is used for the first time, you need to keep, continue it for two years. Um, so we have that kind of data from scientific endeavors down, down the years that may, may, may or may not, of course, be, be, cor be correct, but that's, that's how we um, make the, the decision to, to discontinue or stop medication. And then, of course, if the person um, relapses, the same as with any condition, medical condition like hypertension or diabetes or anything, if somebody relapses, you then re resume the, the, um, the medication. Um, th there, is, there is a problem, I accept, in that sometimes people will be on multiple medications simply because the prior one that was ineffective wasn't stopped. And so that, that is an ongoing problem in psychiatry and it's a very basic one, um, but um, it's commented upon whenever psychiatric units are visited, certainly in Ireland, that there's polypharmacy and overlapping medications that really um, shouldn't, shouldn't be used in that, particular, in that particular way, except in very extenuating circumstances. Um, um, yes, I think I think that was all. The, that was was that all that was asked. David, can you remind me? Was there any other? Element? Yes, that that's along the lines. Thank you very much. Thank you. I I have another question which has been asked to to me privately. This board this borders on a clinical question. So do do be uh, uh, clear if you don't think that it's appropriate to answer it. Um, but I um, somebody's asking about the best course of um, treatment in relation to hormone-based depression, such as postpartum or um, um, miscarriage or um, that might, which might be associated as a side effect of or hormonal contraception, uh, which I guess is a question for, for you, Patricia. Yeah. Um, hormones really, apart from the low mood accompanying the menopause sometimes, hormones aren't usually used for the, um, for the treatment of hormone-related, or what appear to be hormone-related depressions like postnatal depression, um, um, the perimenopausal depression, um, or post-miscarriage depression, or indeed post-abortion depression. Um, the, in, if you look up the Royal College of Psychiatrists website, 
They have a really, really good um, section on postnatal depression and, um, and hormone type related depressions. And there's a lot of interesting material there. If you just go to Royal College of Psychiatrists and go to, um, I think it's leaflets, um, that's the section you find it in. And there's a huge amount of information there from the perinatal mental health group. But the, the sorry, the, the treatment is usually with antidepressants. In fact, it's not with hormones. Um, there's a, a question for somebody who I can't think can be called Fire Tablet, but I guess that's the name of the, uh, his or her uh, machine um, uh, in relation to, to culture. Um, would, uh, would, would, would Fire like to, to ask the question? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sorry, I'm Fire Tablet. I'm actually, <laughs> sorry, that's the name of my uh, tablet. Uh, my name's Tony Coyne. Um, I, I can't quite remember what my question was, but it, it was uh, to do with the uh, uh, issues of culture. Um, I'm actually a, a lawyer, so um, I'm I know I'm straying into an area which is very unfamiliar, but um, I'll give it a go anyhow. Um, my, my question was really concerning... Um, the fact that, um, uh, uh, to my mind, sometimes mental health comes from um, societal issues. And um, you, in one environment, um, something that might be mental health is, is viewed as, as a mental health, whereas uh, perhaps in a completely different environment, it wouldn't be. And again, uh, I've probably got the, 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 the um, clinical issues totally wrong around this, but for example, in Japan, uh, I understand that the response to the menopause is is, 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 is not to have a, a hysterectomy, but it's to sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, there's another approach. So I, I wonder whether perhaps we in the West, in our approach to um, um, psychological um, tr trauma and the likes, um, whether we look beyond uh, what, what we see here in the West or whether we look elsewhere, and finally, I know I'm rambling a wee bit, but um, how can you therefore have like a, um, a, a, um, a uniform approach to, 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 to various conditions if there is perhaps overlaid an environmental um, societal issues that we may not necessarily have in England as opposed to Japan? Which I'll I stop think, now. <laughs> which I think must be a question for Neil. It, 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 but, but it's the subject of a whole kind of sub-discipline of kind of transcultural psychiatry. You are right. Uh, it's, um, I mean, the, 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 thing, the thing that we know if we do systematic cross-cultural comparison is that it's not the same to be a human everywhere and that, that the, but our minds and our bodies are just differently configured. Um, there's, uh, and, and, that, and that includes even things like, you know, emotional life. I mean, it becomes... Uh, becomes clear if I think if you get to know other other places other ways of life that what it feels like to be human is different so of course uh, you know the experience of distress is going, going to be different too um, I don't I mean I mean the question I suppose is is, is you know kind of how does that matter and my um, my sense would be that the, 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 the current way that we, we think about mental disorders and the current way that we treat them reflects, is much less dependent on, on kind of the production of scientific knowledge than, than you might think. I think it's really much more about the kind of obligations that we put our psychiatrists and other mental health professionals under. So if you, if you look, for example, in the 60s, 70s, when you had much less kind of accountability culture, people didn't actually use diagnosis as much. You had all sorts of different kind of things going on. Not necessarily better, just different. I mean, in a way, I don't know what's better and what's worse. But what I suggest is that the regulatory culture has been transformed since then. So that if you speak to kind of sometimes kind of old time as psychiatrists, they say, I mean, I don't know what works and what doesn't, but I do know that health and safety wouldn't allow me to practice like that anymore. So it's not necessarily, you know, we're discovering more. I mean, it's in the sense it's our own cultural conditions that shape the way that we treat mental disorders. And that, of course, treats the kind of disorders that people get. So, so in a, you know, in a way, we, we're, we're very, I mean, it's very interesting, we call them disorders, as if like order, orderliness and healthiness are necessarily kind of, you know, tied together. There are a lot of critics who, say, who get worried about things like positive psychology, because they think 
people are just internalizing the kind of neoliberal moral project. So we're just becoming disciplined, organized, prepared producers and consumers. And I, you know, I have to say, I have some sympathy with that. I mean, it can, those sorts of arguments can be kind of overstated, but um, I think we, you know, it, we have to be aware of, of, of that kind of thing. And I think raising those sorts of concerns shouldn't be seen as an attack, but potentially an opportunity to do uh, some kind of beneficial uh, complementary work. That's my view. Thank, Thank you. you. Did you want to come in, Michael? Yes, yeah, so I, I just want to chip in with, well, not, not with such a well thought out answer as, as Neil's, but just to say, just, just to give an example of, of, you know, the difficulty of navigating between diagnosis or treatment and, and social conditions. If, if, if you take a look, for example, at, at DSM-5 in the entry on obsessive compulsive disorder, you'll find that one of the diagnostic criteria, and this is criteria B, so A is presence of obsessions, compulsions or both, and B is the obsessions or compulsions are time consuming, bracket, e.g. take more than one hour per day, close bracket, or cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational or other important areas of functioning. Now, immediately, just from, from listening to that, you can just, I'm, I'm sure it's obvious to most people, to most listeners, that now, how do you, 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 you think about the etiology of that, about how that fits into the person's social context is going to be a tricky a tricky business. I mean, I was struck by what Patricia said in her in her opening talk about you know the need to weight symptoms. I think going even more than just you know, numerical weighting of symptoms, you really have to look at it in terms of of the overall context. I mean, it, perhaps in in some cultures, you know, some some behaviors would be in other in a different culture would be considered borderline OCD. Likewise, to say that it takes up more more than an hour per day. I mean, I know without naming names, I know of somebody who was you know, seeing a psychiatrist for about, you know, um, for the first time reporting, you know, hand, hand washing rituals and things like that. And the psychiatrist was getting a, talking to this person about, you know, the, the various symptoms they were, they, they seemed to be experiencing. And at some point the psychiatrist said, so, and, and how much, how, how much time do you spend on these, these washing rituals? And the person said, um, well, you know, varies from day to day. And the psychiatrist said, well, on a bad day. And the person said, yeah, about an hour or so. Big tick, more than one hour, you know, and that's the kind of approach that perhaps is not so helpful, at least in a vacuum. Thank you. Yes, yes Patricia. Uh, just in answer to your question, um, take PTSD, for example. Um, a very interesting study compared uh, people in Sudan during one of the wars, um, and evaluated the symptoms that they had and how many met the criteria for PTSD, the tick boxing thing that I was talking about earlier. And most of them didn't regard themselves as having any psychiatric disorder at all. They saw it as you know, a, a trial from God and they were sort of turning to their um, own healers. And the man called Derek Summerfield who's actually written quite a bit about the cultural background to the diagnosis of PTSD um, and he has been very critical of it. And, um, and so you might find it interesting to read some of his stuff, Derek Summerfield. Thank you. Thank you, and might I think, that, so I I think we had, sorry. A big point, you might, you might wonder why I gave the example of uh, hysterectomies in Japan, is that my wife is Japanese and she, uh, she used to practice as a nurse. <laughs> yes, my, my wife is also Japanese and, and uh, um, she has low, or she used to have low blood pressure, and in Japan they gave her amphetamines for this. And she came to a GP in in in, in the UK, and they said uh, the kind of low blood pressure you have is is not a disease in England. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, <laughs> so uh, yes, um, I think we have time for one quick question for um, from Emilia. Uh, Villanueva, and you, you get you had a couple of questions, but but if if you want to um, give a short one, sure. Um, I'll I'll ask this question to for Patricia, um, but maybe Michael wants to push in as well. So I totally agree with what you said about how we can tend to overdiagnose psychiatric disorders based on this criteria, but I'm curious to know, um, are there instances when when certain symptoms, like for example, anhedonia of depression or for example, um, oversleeping or overeating, which are also part of the MDD criteria, are actually not um, from a psychiatric disorder, but they're more of something from the will. 
they're they're actually like a lack of virtue, for example, like fortitude. Like, how would you distinguish those? Thank you. Um, well, you would the, the, the crucial thing there, I think, is where you're asking: Are they part of the will, or are they part? Is that my understanding, or is it part of an illness? Um, they can, of course, be very much part of the person's will or personality, if you like. And you assess that by establishing how long they've been there for. Um, you know, do they have a, be a beginning, a middle, and an end? Hopefully, if it's part of the person's makeup and their general uh, behaviors, maybe their way of coping with problems through throughout life, um, you would expect that that would have manifested itself um, for for many years. If it's a recent onset, um, you know, say the person is thirty five and they suddenly start overeating. Um, or oversleeping. To do it. But of course, it's also important to get information from other people because family members may have a different perspective and they may say, no, 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 he, you know, he or she says it's been going on for 10 years, but it's really only been going on for a year. It just seems like 10 years. So, so getting, getting collateral information is very important um, in, in all of these um, cases. And that's one of the reasons why we have the problem. One, one of the reasons we have the problems with, with diagnosis that we have is because people don't often get enough independent information to assist them. All right, thank you. Did you want to say something, Michael? You're mute. Yes, um, I mean, very briefly because of the time. Um, I mean, not, not so much a comment on the specific example you gave, Emil, but, but I think just, I, I mean, it's a very difficult question about some, in practice about how you distinguish between somebody who is, I don't know, simply lacking in, in a particular virtue, a, a particular, you know, positive character trait and somebody for whom the, 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 the lack of that virtue, lack of that character trait, which we would normally consider you know, desirable, or at least part of healthy functioning, is the result of, of, of something else, be that a kind of you know, problem of brain chemistry or, or maladaptive you know, thought process or, or, or something of that sort. And I think it's just to, my, my comment is just to say that um, it's, even where it's not about a lack of virtue, in the sense that this person is a bad person, it's not that because it's not because they are a bad person that we're treating them. That a, that a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist is treating them, and you say you know a virtue which results from will. That's not, but it's not to say that therefore the person presenting with mental illness uh, that there is no room for for free will for to be encouraged to be developed through through therapy. For for, for example, I think that's just. There's a kind of sometimes there's this kind of simplistic view that oh well, either they're free to do it, uh, and if they don't do it, that's because of a lack of virtue, or because they have an illness, whether it's brain illness or or psychological illness, and therefore they're not free to do it. And I think if you look at well, I mean there are some cases where clearly personal free freedom is so so much impinged, maybe for very severe psychotic illnesses that really that you know free will is very much diminished, but there are much more sort of in between cases, like say in personality disorders or even dis disorders of anxiety such as OCD. It's not that the person with the hand washing compulsions is not that they are, that they're being forced to do, to, to do what they're doing, but it's very hard to stop it. But there is still an element where, you know, I mean, freedom can be developed with, with good therapy with by building up the repertoire of reasons or acting in different ways of, of building up a repertoire of thought processes to, to help overcome the maladaptive ones. So I think that's, a, that's, quite, that's just a, a comment or a caveat I'd like to give. And on which, on which point? Um, uh, we have, uh, alas, um, run out of, of time. Um, it's a, a, it's a, a sign of a good discussion that you think, oh, it's frustrating that we'd like to, 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 to go on longer. Um, uh, I'd like to thank very much our speakers, Neil Armstrong, Patricia Casey, and uh, Michael Wee, for giving us uh, lots of things to, to think about. And uh, if, if we have taken away more questions than we, um, uh, than we had when we started, then that's a sign of a productive discussion, I think. So thank you very much.